Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Are you ready to increase your joy, build trust, strengthen your relationship with God? Now is the time. Reach your goals. Press on and get spiritually fit. Hitting the faith gym. Well, good morning. How are you today? Uh, welcome online. If you're joining us, we're glad that you're uh, here. Uh, we believe that we're going to do something significant today as we start this new series. It's a mini series, but it's Hitting the Faith Gym. Uh, and if you've, I don't know if you go to the gym or not, but you know, uh, the gym can be uh, a rewarding experience. It can even be fun. It can be something that's a real positive thing. So uh, we're going to talk about going to the gym, but going to the faith gym. Now, if you were to go to the gym, you're probably going to do three, three things, three uh, aspects to your workout. One would be some cardio, right? That's where you're running, jogging, doing something to get your heart rate up. That's really important. Uh, that helps you to, uh, it helps your cardiovascular system, helps your, uh, help, you know, helps you to, with weight loss, helps you to achieve a lot of the goals uh, most of us have. Uh, the second thing you're going to want to do is some kind of resistance training, weightlifting, something, to, uh, it's a multiplier. It takes whatever you do in cardio and makes it uh, almost twice as effective uh, in your, in how your body responds and all of those things we just talked about, strengthening your muscles, toning, all that. The last thing, very important, a lot of people forget this, but it's stretching. Stretching is very important because it helps to avoid injuries that could come and helps your, uh, helps your muscles uh, respond well, uh, gets the lactic acid kind of distributed throughout your body. So all three of those are important. Today's message, I am going to be your personal trainer. You'll be more effective if you join a gym and you get a trainer. And so today, I'm your trainer, and we're going to do those same three things. We're going to do some cardio, and that's going to be in three different aspects. And then we're going to do five machines, and then we're going to end with some stretching, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let's begin. Um, as we go into uh, uh, this aspect of, of, of hitting the gym, it really begins... With you. That's why this is the message today. Is just, it all begins with you because if you, if you try to come up with reasons why you can't go, you'll have plenty. Reasons why the gym is not going to work from you, you'll have lists and lists of things that you come up with. And so it begins with you making that decision right up front. I'm not going to be one of those people. There's plenty of those people around, and in fact, even in any given day, we can find ourselves slipping into uh, these uh, uh, unhealthy patterns, dysfunctional patterns that keep us not performing well at the gym or not even going to the gym. And so we want to do well. We want to succeed. And so we, uh, we need to pursue that and say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to be like that. I want to be somebody who uh, uh, listens to my spiritual trainer. That's me, okay? I want to listen to my spiritual trainer so I can grow in that. Now, I want to just say one other thing, uh, and that's that there is some stuff outside the gym that's important. I mean, if you go to the gym and you do everything right, but you go home and you binge on Twinkies, uh, that's a problem, all right? You're going to kind of like sabotage derail your efforts. You're wanting results. You're trying to do something effective and, and, and positive in your life, and you find yourself kind of like taking two steps backward. So things like nutrition is very important. And so some of the things we're going to be talking about are, are, are lay the groundwork of that. Lay the groundwork. It's, it's really character. Character can derail our very best efforts. You can have faith to move mountains and see miracles take place. You can see all kinds of great things, signs and wonders, and you can see uh, uh, God working in your life and sensing God's call. But if your character 
is not in, in, in a right alignment, it can kind of like collapse the whole thing. So this aspect of nutrition or what, what I'm really calling Christian character is so important. We're going to be looking at that uh, and we're going, to, uh, we're, we're, we're going to make sure and lay that foundation in, okay? So let's begin with our cardio exercises. We're going to look at three types of people, three types of behavior that we could get involved in, and, and, and two are destructive, to, and one is, is the one we're going for. One is the healthy one. One is the one that's going to help us to achieve our goals. The first uh, type of behavior or person is the accuser. They're the people that blame other people, right? Their favorite phrase is, it's your fault. And they always have a reason. There's always somebody to blame why they aren't achieving their personal goals, why they aren't happy, why they aren't successful, why they uh, always seem to be stuck where they're at. It's so-and-so's fault. Now, we're going to look at a, a biblical character who represents us really well. Her name is Sarai. Her name eventually gets changed to Sarah. She's Abraham's wife. But this is before that, before her name was changed. Her name is Sarai at this point. And in fact, her name means bitter. And she's got some of that stuff going on. She's got some unhealthy behavior going on, which is causing her to be bitter, causing her to be in a sad place in her life. And, it's be, and, and it, as we look at this story, we'll see it, she has a blaming problem. She has, she's an accuser. Listen to this. They're in Genesis 6. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. We're going to be looking at these three different stories. First, first it'll be Genesis 16. It says, Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Now she wanted to have children. She, she, she didn't have any. So she comes up with this idea. Hey, listen, we've got this maidservant. Go ahead and sleep with her. Okay, let's see what Abraham does. Abraham agreed. Wow, what a guy, right? <laughs> okay, you know, if I have to. And so that's how he jumps right in. Abraham agrees to what Sarai said. After Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai took his wife, uh, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant. Hagar gave her to her husband to be his wife. Abraham slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Hagar conceived. When Sarai uh, knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Now, look, notice this key phrase here. Abraham, that's Abraham. Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. It's, if you read this story, it's, it's almost comical, really, because it was Sarai's idea. She comes up with this idea, and certainly Abraham agrees to it, but it's her idea, and then she goes, hey, you did what I said, and it's all your fault, right? You know, she's blaming him. But, you know, there's... We can look at the story kind of from a distance and go, dang, can you believe that? But we fall into that all the time. We're, we're, we, we're, we're, most of us, we are pros at blaming. We can blame everybody until the cows come home, but it's never us, right? It's never what we did. Now, in business, you know, they, there's a term that is used uh, in, in the last uh, five, six, seven years called living above the line. Here's a graphic from it. This in, in the business world, when you when you blame when you don't blame other people, you own yourself, you own responsibility, you take, you're accountable. That's a living above the line. But at work, in the workplace, if you're always blaming other people for jobs that aren't done well and things that go wrong, then uh, then you're living below the line. And excuses. We'll deal with that in a second. So blaming is below the line. It's easy to live below the line. It's easy to blame other people and look around and just share the blame. So we don't want to be, that's, that's a problem, right? You're not going to really achieve your, your goals by blaming other people. Let me give you an exercise that you can work on on your own. Okay, outside the gym, this is on your own. Okay, this is the exercise. You can write it down. Kick your butts. Okay, <laughs> kick your butts. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is because when we use the word butt, Many times, it's, it's in the form of blaming. 
We just, we're, 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 sh we're shirking responsibility. That's what you were thinking, right, when I was saying kick your butts? You know, but you're, we, uh, we, we shirk responsibility. Oh, you know, Sarai would have done that. She would have said, hey, I would be happy, but you, Abraham, you know, slept with Hagar. You did all this. She's shirking responsibility. You know, again, in the business world, you know, at work, if let's say you're a lead, uh, you're a supervisor, you're getting dinged on how some of your subordinates are dressing and somebody comes in and they're, you know, you could say, hey, I like your shirt, but it needs to be ironed. See, well, that person, that subordinate, all he's going to hear is, is, you don't really like my shirt, you just said that. Really, you're just criticizing me. See, and, we t and it kind of negates any positive thing we just said. So if you kick your butt out and you instead put in and, hey, I like your shirt, and it'd be great if you could iron it. That's just a simple, but it, it really changes it. The meaning, it, all of a sudden it's okay, well, you like that, but, you, you know, there's, you, you want more out of that. But we use but so often, you might even find yourself mid-sentence saying it. You know, hey, I like your shirt, but, and then if you catch yourself, just put in and. Just go, I like your shirt, but, and, I want it iron. It doesn't even make sense, right? But we tend to like listen to the last word that we heard. And so we'll kind of like, they'll just like forget the butt part. And somebody listened to what I said last night. They came up and they said, Andy, your message was good last night. And it was too long. <laughs> I thought, touche. I mean, you were listening. Good job. <laughs> so we need to be careful about falling in to blaming. Blaming is really just being lame, right? We, we're, it's, it's, we accuse other people and really we blame others and we're really being lame in that. I was on Amazon. I saw a game that they sell and it's called Pass the Buck. You can get it yourself, Pass the Buck. It's a game of, of really negating your responsibility because here's how you win. It says pass off work to your opponents and fib your way up the corporate ladder. Get rid of the tasks in your hand to get promotions and level up all the way until you reach the top to become the CEO. That's how you win, right? If you just shirk enough responsibilities. But this game really is, goes all the way back. It's, it's a, just a new spin on an old game, which is just blaming others and, and, uh, and shirking responsibility. And... and, and, and all the way back to Adam and Eve. P people have been blaming for a long, long time. And there's, it's easy, it's easy to do if you can fall into that. And, and you can blame anybody for anything. If you're unhappy about something, it can be, well, it's my, my, my boyfriend's fault, my girlfriend's fault, my, 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 my wife, my husband. They would just act differently. If they would just respond differently, then I would be happy. It's my kid's fault. You know, or it's my parents' fault. Or it's, the government's fault because of the policies that are made. It's the president's fault that I'm unhappy. It's the Congress's fault. It's the justice's fault. It's, it's God's fault. He put me in this situation. And we can just go around and just blame. And, but here's the, you'll never achieve your goals. You'll never really make uh, yourself into the person you want to be, who God wants you to be, if you get caught up in always blaming. So this is the first type. This is our first cardio exercise, realizing we don't want to be a blamer, okay? Because we're not going to get anywhere. Number two, second cardio exercise is this, we're going to look at the excusers. Excusers. In other words, they don't blame other people. They just, they have an excuse for themselves. And so their favorite phrase is, it's just the way I am. They have an excuse for everything, for their mistakes, for the lack of spiritual growth, their shortcomings, their failures. It's the ultimate cop-out, right? I can't help it. That's just who I am. That's just the way I am. Here's a parable that describes these kinds of people. Jesus says this in Luke 14. Beginning in verse 16, Jesus says, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he had invited many guests. At the time of that banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited to come, for everything is now ready. So here's this guy. Everybody wants to be uh, in his banquet. But these people, they come up with excuses why they can't go. But they all began to make excuses. That's a key phrase. They all began to make excuses. The first one said, I just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Now, I think Jesus starts out with the most lamest excuse of all, right? 
I mean, just a, it's a piece of land. There's not even a house on it. It's just a piece of land. I got to go check out the land, see if the dirt's still there. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> what? You know, where, where's the land going? You know, it's just like total, totally a, a, a lame answer. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen. I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another came and said, I just got married, so I can't come. So just excuse after excuse after excuse. And we, we all come up with excuses, right? When we don't want to do something, when we're caught, when, we're, when, when we feel uncomfortable. It's like the guy who comes in for the third time in one week, an hour late. The boss goes, oh, why are you late? He goes, well, everything went wrong this morning. I mean, my car wouldn't start, so my wife said uh, she'll take me to work, so she gets ready in 10 minutes, and we, we try to get to work, but the tunnel is blocked, so I jump out of the car, I swim across the bay, <laughs> and then I, I, have to, I have to jog across the, the bridge, I find a, a somebody's bike, I borrow it, I bike 20 minutes to get here. And the boss goes, come on, you got to come up with something better than that. No woman can get ready in 10 minutes. <laughs> excuses, right? We're, we're all good at making excuses. And, and we got to be careful about that because that, that, that'll sabotage us. You know, if you're parents, that can sabotage your own, your own family. We just kind of, in, in, we, we can make uh, that an environment where excuses, where our kids make excuses. You know, there's been surveys where th they talk to empty nesters or, or want to be empty nesters, uh, and they say, what would you do different if you were raising your kids? And they found the number one uh, response was, was a, a response of regret. I would, here's what I would do differently. I would do less for my kids and have them do more for themselves. Because when we do things for our kids, and we do it with the best intentions because we think to ourselves, oh, my life was so hard. And I don't want that for my kids. I want it easier for them. I want them to have a better life. But what we end up doing is, is we end up doing things for them that, that they really needed to do for themselves. Often we rescue them from consequences that they need to pursue through themselves. I mean, no pain, no gain. This is part of the way we grew. So even though in our minds we think to ourselves we want something easier for them, we end up doing them a disservice. And so kids end up becoming, you know, 25, 28, 30, 32. They're still at home. They won't go to school. They won't get a degree. They can't hold down a job. They're angry all the time. And then the parents go, I don't understand it. It makes no sense. I've given them everything. And that is why they're so upset. You, we've made it so easy. And when they were kids, we, you know, many parents just give them allowance. There's no connection. Do they have to do anything? You just get free money. And listen, that does not prepare kids for life because life is not like that, unless you're talking about welfare. So we need to make sure that we teach our kids not to grow up expecting that the world owes them. You know, they say all, all these uh, young people, they have this entitlement mentality. A lot of times parents contributed to that. So we got to be careful that we don't fall into that. And we don't want to have that mentality if you're that person, if you're young or old and you have an entire entitlement mentality, that is just, that's really an excuse for, that's just, that's all it is, is an excuse. I need to take responsibility for my own life and not fall into this trap. George Washington Carver said, 99% of all failures are caused by those who make excuses. They make excuses. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting that, uh, over the last 100, 130 years, three of the most influential figures gave amazing excuses for people to use. You, you, you have Charles Darwin, and you have Karl Marx, and you have Sigmund Freud. Darwin said, you know, you're just a victim of your creation. It's, it's, uh, it's evolution. That's why you do what you do. People grabbed a hold of that. That's a good excuse. And then Marx came along and said, no, no, it's, it's, it's your, your, uh, <clears throat> your circumstances, economics. That's why you behave the way you do. People go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. They grab a hold of that. Good excuse. <clears throat> Sigmund Freud, he came along and said, it's really conditioning. You can blame your parents. It's all your parents. That's, it's your fault. It's their fault. You do what you do. People grab on, oh, yeah, that's a great excuse for me. 
my parents. And so there's lots of excuses. People will give those to you. There's everywhere people will say, hey, you have permission to make an excuse. You know, today, uh, probably more than those other three guys would be genetics. People are gravitating towards genetics and, ge and gene engineering more than, any, more than anything. You can get an excuse for anything you want to do or don't want to do with a gene, right? And they're discovering them all the time. So I was just thinking, there's so many, you know, I can't go into them all, but I thought, well, how about just the seven deadly sins? And I looked those up. What are the genes that would say, I don't, it's not my fault, I can't uphold uh, godliness. Uh, it's my genes. And here's, they found a gene for all of that. Dr. Redford Williams of Duke University School of Medicine discovered there's a gene why people rage out and they have wrath. Dr. Larry Young of the Harvard, Uni uh, Harvard Institute of Medicine says he discovered the promiscuity gene. Dr. Karen Bailales from the University of California says she discovered the jealousy gene. Uh, Jerry Tillone of the uh, Karolinska Institute discovered the killing or the murder gene. Uh, Dr. Uh, Melina Klonenska of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center says she discovered the gluttony gene. Frank Booth of the University of Missouri discovered the lazy gene. And then there's a number of people that discovered the gene for pride and boasting. That's why I do it. You know, I'm just, I'm amazing, but it's just in my genes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, if you want to find an excuse for something, the list is, goes on and on of excuses. And people all go, yeah, oh, poor you. You know, that's why you can't do what you want to do. You know, that's, and, and really, it isn't, it's really attacking God, right? It's saying, God set up rules that I can't, I can't uphold. He's hardwired me a certain way where I cannot uphold what God asked me to do. It's his fault. That's really what it is, right? So if I rage out and kill somebody, it's, it's my genes. If I have an affair on my spouse, it's not my fault. It's, it's my genes. And there's excuses everywhere. And so that will sabotage your, your, your faith workout. If you want to grow in what God has for you, you can't fall in to this area of just making excuses. There's everywhere. The world has them for everyone. You got to do something beyond that. Then there's choosers. Choosers. This is the last aerobic exercise before we go into our machines. Choosers, they set priorities. They set goals that they're trying to achieve. They want to be a success and not a failure. So they accept responsibility, both of their sin and of their spiritual growth. It's my responsibility to work through that, is what a chooser will say. And they want to choose. They don't believe it's by chance or by circumstance. They believe that God gave them freedom, and with that comes responsibility. Now, we, a great example of this is found in Hebrews chapter 11, with Moses. Moses is this, Moses is this great hero found in this, uh, this hall of faith. It says, by faith, there in uh, verse 23, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, when Moses had grown up, he refused that's a key word, circle it. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and he, what, chose, so circle that, chose, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he, was, he, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's wrath, or the king's anger, and persevered because he saw him who's invisible. How do you see somebody invisible? Through faith. But Moses is this guy, he has, he's, Egypt at that time was the, the most powerful country on earth. He's second in command. He's got things going pretty well. I mean, he's got, he's got uh, the status that anybody would want. He's got the wealth that anybody could ever imagine and want. He's got all of the pleasures of Egypt. And he says no to that. He instead aligns himself with a half a million Israelis who have been in bondage and slavery for, for 400 years to help them escape. It leads them out to go into 
uh, into, towards the promised land, right? That's his mission. And he does that. He goes, I'm going to take this over all of that. And there were some hardships along the way. 40 years of hardship, by the way, in the desert. I mean, it wasn't all uh, easy, but he chose to do that. He said, hey, here's a simple, easy life. And I'm sure some people came along and said, hey, Moses, you look at the position you have. Why don't you just stay where you're at and push for social reform? Think of the kind of advances you could make for the slaves. And you could really help them a lot. You've got a lot of position. You've got the Pharaoh's ear. You know, there's probably tempta temptations for that. Instead, he goes, no, I'm, no, this is the social ill of my day. I'm going to do something about it. And he rises up and does it, even though it's challenging for him. That's what it means to choose. I'm going to choose something, even though it's hard. You know, uh, in the 1800s, there was a great example of this. This uh, white lady, she was the, the daughter of pastors who were against slavery, spoke out against slavery. And she decides to do something about it. This is the great social ill of her day. The Fugitive Act of 1850 had just been passed, and so you had all these slaves <clears throat> who had escaped in the Underground Railroad. They were in hiding. Many of them were there for years. They had, they had made their life up in the north, and now the government comes and funds a bill that allows them to go get these, these, these uh, uh, ex-slaves and, 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 and pulls them back down into, into slavery. 300 of them had already been uh, brought back down into slavery. And she's devastated. She goes, I got to do something. She's a young, in the 1850s, she's a, a, a small, petite, white girl. She goes, I can write. And so she writes Uncle Tom's Cabin. This book <clears throat> helps the whites of that day, thousands of them, to see the, horror, the horrors and the, and, the dis, and, the, and the inhumanity of slavery, really for the first time. And she couldn't get anybody to publish it at first. Publisher after publisher said no, because it was too dangerous. And, and, and so finally she gets some reluctant publisher to publish it, and she ends up publishing a million and a half books. This is back in that day, that was a major, uh, just a huge, huge amount. Over, I mean, there was no paperback books, there was no digital downloads, no uh, big big box bookstores and and it and it starts all these people start rising up and in one infamous situation she had death threats she had somebody send her a parcel an anonymous parcel with the ear of a disobedient slave and threatening her but she because of that she causes this firestorm that rises up later on in 1862 abraham lincoln calls her down to see uh, Harry Beecher Stowe, and it says, so you're the small lady who wrote the book that started this great war. And she, she said, I'm going to do something about this. It was dangerous. It was scary. She goes, but I can write. Listen, when you choose to do what God wants you to do, it's not always easy. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes it's hard. It's almost always hard, if not always. I mean, when does, when does God call people to do something that's easy? Not very often, right? It's something difficult. And you go, okay, God, I want to be one of those people. Now, God has a plan for your life. He wants to do something great in your life. You've got to choose, though. That's part of responsibility. Part of, respons part of freedom is to say, I am going to recognize I'm responsible for that freedom. Now, in Romans 14, 12, it says that we are accountable for our own lives, even though you could look to the government. You could look for conditioning, genes, uh, the justices. There's all kinds of things you could blame. God says, no, ultimately, it ends with you. It says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. God has given you the freedom to do what you want with your life, but he holds you accountable for the results. He holds you accountable for those results. And so you need to, uh, you need to take this seriously. Say, hey, I'm going to do something about this. I'm not going to just sit on the sidelines. So let me give you some, we're going to jump on the, uh, the, the machines now. Five machines, things that you can do. This is going to help your workout. It's a multiplier from what we just looked at. Okay, first of all, the first machine is a time machine, not the kind that makes you go back in time. This is about how you spend your time, the time machine. And it's, the, it's the, you're accountable for your time. Psalm 90 Verse 12 says, teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. 
In other words, you start with the end in mind. Hey, there's going to be a day of accountability. Teach me to number my days. Use my time wisely, as Ephesians 5.16 says. Then there's the word machine. In other words, you've got to make sure and exercise your words. Do, you think through what you say. Uh, you're, we're accountable for those. Jesus said even every idle word we're accountable for. Here's what he said. He said, and I tell you the truth, that you must give an account on judgment day of every idle word you speak. Sometimes I'll hear somebody have, you know, some curse word, and then they notice I'm in the room. Oh, sorry, you know, pardon my French. I mean, so you don't have to say sorry to me. You just use God's name in vain. You should be apologizing to him. I mean, we're accountable for what we say. Then there's the body machine. <clears throat> the Bible says that we're accountable for our bodies, how we treat them. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. Why is the body important? Because that's how God's given us this, a body. We can't do ministry without it. We, we, we can't serve others without it. We can't do good deeds without it. We can't participate in what God's doing. If, you know, we need the energy we need to be working for us. And so that means we need to take care of our body, how we eat, uh, how we, uh, you know, nutrition, all that, as well as, you know, taking care of ourselves and, uh, you know, using, you know, uh, sunblock or whatever you need to take care of your body because this is the thing that god's given you okay and so he wants he that's that's another machine then resource machine in other words our resource god has given us resources finances he says if god has been generous with you he will expect you to serve him well but if he has been more than generous he will expect you to serve him even better and then the attitude machine attitude is so important making sure our attitude's on right. We're accountable for even our attitude. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. Okay, so those are the five machines. Now, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of dial down. Workout's over, we're gonna stretch, okay? And, and, and stretching is just to prevent injury, as I said. And so this is an important part of, the, of, 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 our, of our faith gym experience, that we don't want to end up doing all this stuff and then we end up injured. We end up in a place where we didn't want to be, even though I did it all right, we end up injured. Well, here's the thing is, is the Bible says there is a day of accountability, a day where we will be, fa the, the Bible calls it over and over, the day of the Lord. That means that's the day that you see God face to face. He'll either come back, Jesus will return, or you'll die and you'll see him, and that's the day of accountability. But he doesn't want you just to, like, you know, just have one experience. That, and all along the route, see, we have short-term uh, short opportunities, little tests, and, and, and that's with other believers. We get little opportunities to kind of encourage one another, and, and that's what small groups are about. Like, there are little interval trainings all along the way where we get, it helps us to be prepared for that, for that day. Now, what's going to happen on the, on the day? Well, here's, here's, here, how do you prepare? Okay, this is, so you don't end up in injured. You don't end up in a place you don't want to be, okay? How do you prepare? Number one is you need to just admit that you have a problem with it. See, it's easy to say, hey, I don't really blame people. I just have some justified gripes. You know, I just, you know, and it's, I'm not blaming anyone. They actually are the problem. Well, see, this is, it's hard for us to admit that we have blaming problems, that we tend to uh, excuse ourselves from really answering the responsibility that the freedom that God gave us uh, it, it calls us to. So admit it. This is a problem. This is wrong. This is a sin, the Bible calls it. I need to, I need to, I need to address that. So this is important. That's part of our, you know, admit it. And then you recognize that you're accountable to God. Say, God, I'm accountable. And so I want to, I, and, and you just say, God, help me to accomplish this. Notice this last verse, I have it up on the side screens. It says, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. You see, God says, certainly admitting it is important because uh, we, can't, we can't get stuck in the blaming and the excusing because that's a never-ending losing battle. But he says, if you admit it, and then you confess, and, and he says, you get a second chance. 
You get a do-over. You get, okay, God says, I want to be there for you. I'm going to help you. And so that's what we do in prayer. That's kind of like the final breathing. You know, if you've done stretching, there's kind of the breathing at the end. And prayer is where we just breathe and just say, God, I'm going to admit this. I need a fresh start, okay? Would you pray? Let's bow our heads and pray right now. Lord, I, as the designated spiritual trainer, I stand here and, uh, and I'm going to invite everyone to pray with me. Just pray with me. Just say, God, I admit, I blame. That's my go-to place. Sometimes I'm more like Sarai than I really want to admit. I look to put the fault on other people, other circumstances, things that are out of my control. But you know, God says that you, there's a lot of things you can't control, but you always can control your response, how you respond, your attitude, your behavior. And so then would you just, as a, another deep breath, just take a breath and say, God, forgive me, empower me. Give me that second chance you promise. Would you invite Christ into your life right now? Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Empower me. Give me hope. Give me strength. Help me to not look back and get caught in the past. I can't control that. Help me to look forward. So I can look forward to what you're going to do in my life. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for everyone who has prayed to ask Christ into their life right now. Everyone who has admitted and said, God, I need a fresh start. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to come upon them. Lord, do a transformative work right now in Jesus' name, Lord. We pray this. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.